Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show. Discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Hosted by Desiree Duffy. Welcome one and all. It is time for the Books That Make You Show. And I'm your host, Desiree Duffy. And today we're talking about books that make you choose your own adventure. Or as you may find out, you might die trying to choose your own adventure. Remember those choose your own adventure books back in the day? Well, they've grown up a little bit and it's absolutely and deliciously horrifying. (laughs) Today we have two guests, authors Mark Talias and John Palisano. And they have written together. They've collaborated, which is really awesome and exciting. So I want to learn about that process. In the in the, they've made the latest entry in the Try Not to Die series. Um, and they've collaborated to bring forth this this hair raising and adrenaline fueled thriller. Now the premise of these books is readers can choose the end uh, at the they make a decision at the end of each chapter. So one choice might lead them to a gruesome horrifying death and might one choice might lead them down an entirely different path. So Mark Tullius is the author of Unlocking the Cage exploring the motivations of MMA, MMA fighters and dark fiction, which includes Ain't No Messiah, Untold Mayhem, Twisted Reunion, 25 Perfect Days, plus five more. And I'll let him talk a little bit more about his very lengthy resume. As well, author John Palisano. He's the president of the HWA. That's the Horror Writers Association. He's a Bram Stoker Award winner. He has many books under his belt. One of my favorites is Night of a Thousand Beasts. And without further ado, I will let each of you just kind of say hi and tell us a little bit more because you mm-hmm. both have so many books, so many credits under your belt. I want, I don't, I don't want to like murder your introductions and not do it justice. So John and Mark, welcome to the show. And John, let's start with you. Just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Oh, hi. Well, I, I think of myself as a creator first and foremost, I work in a lot of different mediums some um, over the years. Um, I've been a writer since I was very young um, when I won my elementary school, one of the, the writing competitions. And that's always been my big passion is, is writing. When I was like touring with bands, um, I was writing my first novels rather than going and doing the whole groupy drug thing to preserve my voice. I'd go with a notebook and it started as writing songs. And then I started writing what I would see. And then I wrote stories from that. And while we were, while we were touring, I would go visit colleges and everybody thought I was crazy. (laughs) They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to go jump into Emerson here or BU and just go meet with them. And they're like, what, what? You don't want to (laughs) go drinking with us? I'm like, no, I want to show them my book and stuff. And um, so I kind of got started there. And then I worked in the film industry for over 10 years as, you know, director's assistant and, and that sort of thing. And I just kind of transitioned over to novels and I still still do all that. And I, I write almost every day. I love it. That's my safe place is, is creating, um, be it songs or, drawing or books. That's pretty much who I am. <laughs> and we also have Mark Tullius. Mark, can you just tell us a little bit more about you and your wonderful writing and a little bit of your backstory? Well, thank you so much for having us on. This is awesome. Um, I didn't find writing until my 20s, and I was really surprised when it found me. It was just something I had to do. Uh, Many of the short stories, I was loving short stories. That's why I felt really strong. Then transition to novels. Uh, I was surprised that I wanted to do any nonfiction, but I did a sociological study of MMA fighters. I went to 100 gyms, interviewed close to 400 people, uh, trying to understand why they fought, why I fought, and uh, yeah, so that's that's what I'm doing now. So it's a combination of these Try Not to Dies, fiction novels, uh, short stories, and I'm doing a nonfiction book on traumatic brain injuries that goes really well with the MMA. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, that right there is an interesting topic, especially I love it when authors take their real life experiences. John traveled to colleges and worked on, you know, what, what was in a band. And then, you know, taking that real psychology 
and the study of how people think and how they react, because at the core of everything, that's what impacts our fears. And that's what horror is all about. And knowing what triggers that and how to manipulate that and use that in your writing is a marvelous thing, in my opinion. So let's start. So I, I do want to talk about this book series. So can one of you set the stage and just tell us about the, the series as a whole? Mark. Okay. Um, well, I got the idea for the series uh, maybe eight or nine years ago. I used to love Choose Your Own Adventures. I mean, I think that is what led me to reading. I would read those all the time as a kid. Um, and then I had this idea. My The first idea for uh, At Grandma's House was the first book. And it was really going to be a massive thing with all these different choices. And then I realized it was just too difficult to do. It was going to be too big of a book. Uh, and so I was like, okay, we'll just have one correct way through the book. And then all the choices will end in death. Any incorrect choice ends in death. And so it's pretty brutal. Um, <laughs> Some people that are used to the Choose Your Own Adventure, they might be a little disappointed because they want different story branches, but this is one correct way through it and then all these ways to die. Um, so it's uh, for me, it's a lot of fun. It could be pretty brutal, uh, and I'll have John talk about this, but in this, some of these death scenes really kind of shook me up, especially not only just how brutal they were, like violent-wise, um, but it's when uh, this boy and his uh, girlfriend are dying. Like some of them are pretty sad, and it was it was it was a little little bit tough for me to write. Uh, but that's where I got the idea for the series, and I have right now. There's about twenty in the works, and I plan on doing about three a year. So that's impressive. And I just gotta say, I can see why you pulled in John Palisano to help out with this because as you're talking about death, he's giggling. He, he's over there <laughs> laughing. You're like, it's horrific. It's ter ter terrible. And he's, he's, he's snickering about it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that was one, one of the, the best parts of this collaboration for me is um, I would send Mark material and then he'd come back and say like, hey, you know, why don't we move the I, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but why don't we move that death? And, and like, you know, um, just the ideas he had, I was like laughing out loud, literally. Um, with some of the things he'd say, like, why don't we do this and that? I'm like, oh, that is so brutal. <laughs> it's so twisted. And it was just so much fun to go back and forth and, and just try to up each other's antes all the time on the death scenes. <laughs> and Mark, being a fighter, brought a lot of great choreography to some of those deaths, too, which was really, like, cool. And I think, like he mentioned, I think we, we were both a little surprised at some of the emotional gravity we were able to get in, in some of the deaths. Because it wasn't just, like you know, an 80s slash your death and kabooey, they're gone and that's it sometimes. But a lot, a lot, the other times we were like dealing with like last thoughts and like final memories and things like that. And it was pretty like emotionally harrowing. We, we put a lot, a lot of ourselves into those scenes, which was surprising. <laughs> well, and that just sounds so fascinating. And this digs into that psychology I was talking about a little bit too, because the point of view of the reader in this is, their point of view. So it's a little bit unlike most types of writing where you put the reader, it's you, it's you are doing it, not I or we. So there's a difference in the perspective for the reader. And that I think makes it more visceral. Would you guys agree? I think so. And I've, I've had a lot of readers say it causes them a lot of anxiety because of that too. So when it's time to make a decision, they say they could actually feel you know, this tension, um, cause they feel like it is them. Uh, and that's one reason why I love first person, especially with this series. And now I have to just assume that this book is not for everyone. So this is probably not something that you want to get for your 12 year old nephew, um, for Christmas. This is probably something that's a little bit mature. Would you agree? Uh, this is a little bit hard to say because this one is really young adult Adults are loving it because it makes them, it reminds them of Choose Your Own Adventure. I don't know. It is pretty violent. I don't know. My, my daughter is 12 and I would be okay with her reading this. I wouldn't be okay with her reading the next one that's scheduled, which is super high uh, because there's some more adult stuff in it. Um, but John, what would you say as far as age? I, I think it's it'd be more of an emotional age and, mm -hmm. and predilection than an actual number age. Um like, like you said, my own son would probably, you know, even a few years ago would have dug this, 
you know, cause he's into, he's into gore. He's into horror movies and it is his favorite movie. And his favorite part is when Georgie's arm gets ripped off. He screams, <laughs> you know, he loves it. Um, but other kids won't, but we're seeing other adults are sensitive to that level of violence and, and intensity as well. Um, so I think it's more of a, a, an intensity warning than, than a, than a age warning. Ah, I like yeah. that. that. That makes perfect sense because right now we are, we're, we're a little bit hypersensitive because of the real pandemic. So let's talk about very specifically this book. Can you set the stage for this specific book in the series? Well, when I approached John, I think it was at the start of the pandemic and we did not know what it was going to be about. I just saw that he was going to have some free time. I thought it was a great opportunity. Um, and I said, you know, let's figure out what we want to write about. And then, John, if you want to go into how that kind of decision came about. Right. Well, yeah, we, we weren't sure. We, we, we were thinking that the pandemic would be at the most a few months long. And we actually thought, you know, maybe we shouldn't do a pandemic and call it something else because this might be old news by the time it even gets out there. <laughs> and uh, it's still going pretty strong. But we also didn't want to just root it in the actual coronavirus. We came up with our own virus, which is which is different. And I, I thought it um, would be a really good challenge because we're all trying to survive this at the same time. And a lot of people, as we were writing, the, the, the funny thing happened that it became real to a lot of people. Um, I've had a lot of people who had it. Uh, I lost friends. I lost cousins to it. Um, I fought the virus myself while I was writing this and it became a very real thing. It, it came from like, Hey, this will be a fun fictional idea to really being able to pour ourselves into this at a re very real way, which was cathartic in a way that I hope translates to the readers as well. So it was a really interesting, right? One of the most interesting writing processes I've, I've ever gone through in, in, in that regard. Um, but to fictionalize it too, we, we 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 made our own virus called the heliovirus, which is you know a couple degrees different than than the real one, of course. But it's still there, and I thought it would be really interesting to center this on a cruise ship, um, so that it, we'd have like just this this boiler kind of place where we we could have all the action. And and the way I've been telling people, it's kind of like Die Hard on a cruise ship. But with teenagers, a teenage John McClane, you know, and um, and that's kind of how it feels. So they're trapped in there. They can't get out. And it's up to this this young guy and his girlfriend to kind of fight these terrorists. And they're really they're really nasty. Um, and it's scary. And, you know, if you put yourself into those shoes, what the heck would you do if you were 15, 16 and these serious terrorists were pursuing you and they were killing people left and right? That's terrifying. And we've seen some of the real terrorist videos and they don't flinch. And you can't reason with them. And we thought this is a very terrifying scenario, especially if everybody's locked down and you can't communicate and everybody's self-isolated in there. It's ups the ante big time. Yeah, it, it sounds like you really pulled in a lot of those you know, elements of horror, you know, trap people somewhere, give them no way out, you know, force them into this, this situation. Um, tell us a little bit about this writing process. How do you collaborate writing, well, I guess any book, but especially a book like this? Tell us about some of the intricacies of that. Well, I think every book is definitely proven to be different. Um, like in, in book two, uh, that author, she really helped build one of the characters and different things like that. With this book, John came up with this story. This is, I consider this John's story. He gave me the rough draft and then I was able to go in and add to it, take away, do my thing. And then we would just go back and forth. And um, so, yeah, I, I consider this, you know, he wrote this story and then I put my little spin on it. And like we, we introduced, he had some like this great character, Amy, the girlfriend. And in the first version, she was just a side character, had a small part. I was like, no, she needs to be a main character. So we wrote that in there. And then I would see other death scenes that he wrote, like, you know, this one guy got killed a certain way and it was just a really, you know, it was only a couple couple lines. I was like, no, our guy needs to be killed that way. That has to be a death scene. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so for me, it was fun to be able to go through and just see what he did and then put my little spin on it. And then he took it and then he put his spin and just going back and forth like that until we had something we were both really happy with. 
Now, the characters in this, are, are they making appearances in other books in the series, too, or are they exclusive mm -hmm. to each book? How does that work? Well, uh, John came up with an awesome ending, which leaves it open to another one, because in prior to this, each of these Try Not to Dies is standalone. So they could just, they're completely standalone. Some are connected to other books. Uh, like book two is Try Not to Die in Brightside, which is one of my novels. Um, but so all these characters are different, but I have a feeling that we will be reintroducing these people uh, for part two of the pandemic. And John also has another one in the Wild West. Um, I'm not sure the t official title yet, but that'll probably be like book six uh, in this series. So yeah, we got a lot, but that, again, that will be completely different characters, complete different setting. Um, I want to just explore as many different areas as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, are you mapping this out? Are, do you have like a wall, like a, a show Bible or outlines? Like how, how are you conceptualizing all of this? Because this sounds like quite an undertaking. Um, for each book, I don't, I kind of have a rough, like, okay, I know it's going to be about 20 to 22 different chapters. Uh, they're probably going to be, I, I don't worry about length or anything like that. I just asked my co-author to co help me come up with the overall story. We'll write it out, and then we'll figure out where we break it up, where the death scenes are. So it's pretty pretty organic. I, I think the story comes first. The main story comes first, and then the death scenes present themselves and, and the places for choices. Um, and so, John, I don't know about your writing process, but I usually just do a, a really quick outline and then go from there. Right. Well, I, I'm usually a serious outliner. Um and I think early on, I sent you a really extensive outline with, mm -hmm. with, with each death kind of, you know, idea on there. And, and you shared it with, I think your daughter and, you know, you, you, you got, you liked some of the, the uh, language in there was fun. Um, so I do that, but, but usually that changes halfway through the book starts to go its own way. Um, for this particular one, I actually got a blueprint of a, of a ship, of a cruise ship. And and kind of plotted like act one, two, and three where it would be throughout the ship. And that helped out a lot just for geography and continuity sake, because it can be really confusing if you're just trying to think and picture a cruise ship if you're not that familiar with it. Um, so that helped out a lot. And also the other thing I, I shared with Mark was we did a, um, a, a kind of like an, a, like an idea board, like a creative idea board where I would take some pictures and some graphics and send it to him and say, this is kind of the feel of the book I have. And then he'd send me some stuff back, like some pictures, like this is what I was thinking. And, you know, here's the kind of weapon he might use. Here's the kind of crossbow I was thinking. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's a good one. You know, and then he'd send me another one. Well, look at this one. It's like, you know, got a steel tip and it'll pierce the heart through the <laughs> breastbone. We're like, yeah, let's do that one instead. You know? So there were, there was a lot of little details like that, that were, that were ironed out. That is so cool. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, it's like writing, a program, a computer program, yeah. right? Because you have all of these different possibilities. Like, if not this, then this. If th not this, then this. And you're just branching off. How many possible outcomes are there? I think there are 30 death scenes. I, yeah, I think there's, so there's one correct way. And I think it's probably about 29 or 30 ways to die. So you can read this 30 times and have a different outcome every time that you read it. You you could die thirty times. You you would only have one happy ending. Um, so and that's what uh, ends up happening. Lots of times people will read through it, and then even if they don't die, I'm finding lots of readers will go back and read the death scenes because they enjoy <laughs> them being killed. Um, yeah, so there's there's quite a few ways to die, and that's a struggle too. Trying to make each of the death scenes different. Like, okay, how many times can we allow them to be shot? How many times can they be burned? How you know, we need to have someone be crushed. We need to have someone, you know, blown up, uh, drowned. Like, how many different ways can we do it where it's still you know unique to this book, and each one is somewhat different. Yeah, Mar Mark's breakdown um, after our first draft. Where he he listed all the different like death by knife, gun, 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 knife, and he'd be like, you know, we have too many guns. We got to kind of switch that. Let's think of some other objects to kill people with here. And it was so funny just to see it broken out like that. I'm like, oh my god, I feel like a mass murderer here. <laughs> yeah, I would hate to see your browsing history. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's pretty pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Getting cloaked by the five O driving around suddenly. <laughs> right, right. Use an incognito window when you're looking this stuff up. Right. <laughs> you right. don't want the FBI on you. Good idea. 
probably. <laughs> so, so, and when you're doing this too, so, okay, you have 30 ish different deaths in this book. And when you expand that out into your entire series, like you, you, you're probably at the end of the day going to have all of like a bazillion different death scenes. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's interesting trying to make them different. And so there'll be similarities with all of them, but then sometimes I'll switch it around and it's like, okay, well, it wasn't the main character that died. It was his, you know, best friend or, or, or whatever else, or instead of being shot in the head, it was shot, you know, bled out through the leg. And so just trying to, um, yeah, make them different. Uh, and then each each book has its own possibilities. Like, you know, the Wild West is going to have some interesting stuff. I think we're going to have a lot more death by animal, you know, and, and there's going to be some that are a lot of monsters. Some are going to be, we have one that's a, a war one in Iraq. And so that's going to be a lot of death by gun, but we'll, we'll figure out ways to make it exciting, I think. Oh yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, I, I've read John's um, Night of a Thousand Beasts, so I can see <laughs> that expertise possibly helping out in that that respect. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about the character development because I, I think back to the old days. You know, the choose your own adventure books. They were pretty flat. Everything was very mm -hmm. flat. It was, it was very basic. I think those those were more for you know tween readers than young adult readers. So talk a little bit about the character development in the, in these books. Okay. John? Great. Um, great question. Um, one of the things that I almost always do is I do a kind of 50 questions thing when I'm developing a character and that's from my acting background. So when you're developing um, a character, when you're an actor, there's a list of, you know, 25 to 50 questions you ask yourself, where was I born? What's my favorite color? What's my favorite food? What's a childhood trauma? Those sorts of things. So I go through that process when I develop the character, the main characters, not for every single character, of course. And that helps a lot. And that helps to inform a lot of decisions. Um, so when I, you know, just going through that process alone can really help. And I, I, any writer out there, you can just Google like acting 25 questions, 50 questions. And I think it would really help you out to get rid of the flatness. Cause it makes you really some, it start, they start easy, but then they get kind of hard. Like what was the first time you, your heart was broken? You know, do you have any dreams that are unfulfilled? Those sorts of things get in there. And when you're with that character in a cabin, um, and there's a, you know, a bad guy coming when, when you look around, you kind of, you, you can get into that character's head, kind of like how an actor gets into a character's head and you know what they're going to do, you know, what would seem stupid to them and what would seem realistic for them to do. So I advise that process. That's my process. Some people just go right into it and they're fully formed and they've got them in there already. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between <laughs> plotting and pantsing is yeah. you're, you're more of a plotter. And yeah. Even with that. Plotter. Yeah. Even with character development. Sure. <laughs> how, about, how about advice for potential future authors, writers? What would you like to say to them at, if they're starting out? I would say just do it. Just write. Um, I think the biggest thing that slows people down and that slowed me down was worrying about things being perfect. Uh, you know, when you come up with the perfect line, the perfect start, the perfect whatever. Now, like, no, it's like, just, just write, just get it out there. Uh, you're going to change it so much along the way. You're not going to know the start until you've already done the entire thing. So I just really suggest write as much as you can without worrying, without editing, without any of that uh, voice in your head saying you can't do it and just have fun and, you know, work that muscle. It's, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, to develop it, but the more you do it, the better and stronger it's going to be. Yeah, and I'll echo Mark that that's exactly, the, yeah, I, I couldn't say it better with that aspect. The other aspect I would add is to read and read widely and read everything. Read magazine articles, read out of, if you're into horror, read science fiction, read romance, you know, read everything you can get your hands on, read the classics. Read bad books so you, and read good books, too. If somebody says, oh, it's the worst book, go and read it because that helps exponentially. Um, the one thing I always think that is underestimated is voice. You can get through the mechanics. You can get through all that. But if me and Mark and Desiree each, you know, took a story like, say, To Kill a Mockingbird, we would each write a different book. 
-hmm. It would have a different perspective, would have a different feel. All of our voices would be different. And I, I encourage all writers to feel like that because it's not about the million dollar idea. In the 80s, there was this thing about like you have to come up with this brand new idea and it has to be this revolutionary thing that's never been done before. But if it's poorly written, then you're dealing with a sci-fi movie of the week. Because mm -hmm. a lot of those have great concepts that you've never seen before, but they're so poorly executed. You're like, oh, my God, I can't even get through this. So it's really about the voice and your execution. Like if, if Mark, if you if you had The Shining to write right now, if you if you couldn't reference any of the original material and you wrote that book, it would not be anything like Stephen King's book. Same with you, Desiree, and same with me. And I think that's an important lesson for writers to know and have confidence in their own voice and their own point of view. That is excellent advice. I think too, being involved with either a writer's group or an organization, I'll give you a chance here as I segue into HWA, if you wanna talk that up, especially for anybody who's an aspiring or is a horror writer. You wanna talk a little bit about, about that, John? Well, sure. I think any organization is as good as the people in it. And um, it can be an amazing opportunity if you hook up and if you're open. Um, and I think that's something that's really important to look into. Um, on the flip side, it can, it's not a great fit for every single person out there. Um, but these organizations and like, like Greater Los Angeles Writer Society, uh, there's so many uh, sisters in crime. If one doesn't fit you, there's probably another one that does. There's lots of um, like the Writer's Coffee House that Jonathan Mayberry has been doing around the country is amazing and it's free and it's really supportive and wonderful too. Um, so if one organization doesn't seem to be a good fit, look, look around. Um, I think having a support system helps a lot because we are very walled off and we're on our own islands a lot of the time. And it can really help, especially when it comes to business aspects and contracts and how do I go from writing this to actually getting it to people to read, <laughs> you know, and buy it and make, hopefully make a living at it from one day. And th these organizations are, are invaluable in that regard. Exactly. And one of the, the things that the pandemic has done is it's brought a lot of these organizations more so online. They are doing conferences online. There's writers workshops online. So there's no longer the excuse of I can't be involved with the greater Los Angeles Writer Society because they're in Los Angeles. Doesn't matter as long as you have a good internet connection. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Go, no, go ahead. No, I, I agree, and 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 the whole the the whole Zoom uh, revolution has been amazing. There's so many free seminars. Um, there's Nano Ramo just right uh, mm -hmm. wrapped up, and they have it for for teens now too. That's another amazingly supportive organization, and it's all online, which works out well for writers because we like being online. We like being able to you know pop out when we want to, and then go back in when we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Doing it in our, on our own terms. Okay, yeah. I want to give each of you a chance quick to tell us individually about any projects, books, other than this series that you might be working on that people should watch out for. Mark, I'll, I'll start with you. What, what else do you got in the works? Um, I got a lot. Well, the Traumatic Brain Injury book will be out next year. Try Not to Die Super High will be book number four next year. Um, and I know I'll have book five and six out next year as well, too. Just don't know what they are yet. But I uh, no, I, I plan on being very productive. Uh, if anyone wants to check out my stuff, they could go to Mark at, uh, just marktulius.com. Fantastic. And John? Great. Well, my next big release is going to be the next Try Not to Die uh, in the West, in the Old West uh, next year. So that's I'm very much looking forward to that. I always have a lot of short stories coming out and some nonfiction uh, coming out over the next year or two. There, there's something coming out at Cemetery Dance, uh, Tales from the Lost Three. There's, there's several uh, more stuff uh, in that regard coming out. And like Mark, my site's www.johnpalisano.com if you want to check out anything I have to offer. Also, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Just I'm the only one on there, so you can find me pretty easily <laughs> the only john palisano in the world i love it i love it you guys this has been great and really quick we can find the try not to die series amazon all the usual places is that right yeah right now it's amazon kdp uh paperback is through anywhere but uh yeah right now the ebook is through kdp on amazon Fantastic. If anybody can't find it and you want to do that library thing, I always encourage people to call your library and ask them yeah. to order it because that way the book gets into that library, not just for you to read, but for other people in the community to read too. Mm -hmm. John and Mark. 
Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you. I love the Try Not to Die series, and this book is amazing. Thank you for sharing it with us today. Uh, thank Thanks you for having us. us. And thank you, everybody, for being here today on the Books That Make You Show. Again, my name is Desiree Duffy, and you can always find us on our website. It's booksthatmakeyou.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram. And, of course, we've got that YouTube channel that we encourage you to subscribe to so that you can check out shows like this, plus all sorts of other great programming that we are doing. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The executive producer for Books That Make You is Desiree Duffy, produced and sound mastered by Phil Jean Grande, engineering by Dave Napox, social media and promotion by Bree Sweeter. For more, visit booksthatmakeyou.com.